you look in your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 31 to 91, we are going to read this today. I think this passage is very real, has been very real to me over the last little while as I've studied it, and I think for a lot of you as well. Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. It's God's word. We're in prayer. Lord, Father, um, speak so truthfully, speak so clearly, speak, God, from these broken, sinful lips. And may your Holy Spirit... Convict and rebuke, encourage, lead. Huh. We want to see Jesus in this passage. Oh, how God, I know your word is just so, so huge. The Lord, even just what we've read there today, there is countless sermons we preached on this passage. I pray that today my brothers and sisters would take what they need to hear, what you are calling them to hear. Amen. Jesus is the Son of God who has come as servant and Savior to sinful people. This is what Mark is trying to get through to us. I've said it over and over and over again. Up until this far in Mark, Jesus is asking the question, do you know who I am? Do you get it? Do you get by all the miracles, by all the things that I'm saying, by all of the, the, um, <clears throat> the healings that I've done, do you know who I am? And last week we see, because uh, up until our, our pastors that we looked at last week, the disciples just, you know, they just kept flying over their heads. Who is this guy? I know he must be somebody good. He does some crazy cool stuff. But who is he? And then we remember last week, Peter proclaims that Jesus is the Christ. Now, what that entails is huge. That is huge. He is the Messiah. He is the one who will be able to take the sins of the people away. He is the one who will come and rescue them. He is the king. He is the sovereign Lord himself. So what Peter was saying in the word Christ is, is huge. It's huge. It carries with it so much stuff, so many titles, so much of an identity of who Jesus is. And it's today that we see this dramatic shift in Mark's gospel. Things are moving really fast. Remember one of the key phrases we see in the book of Mark is immediately. You know, Jesus gets off a boat and immediately goes here. And then after he finishes there, he immediately goes there. It seems like from this point on, things just kind of slow down a little bit. Because Mark is trying to get us to focus on something. He's trying to get us to see the specifics of something. The first half of the book of Mark is Jesus saying this, I am the Son of God. 
And the second half of the book of Mark is this. I am the son of God going to the cross. That's what he's trying to get through to his disciples. And he says this plainly. Jesus did not want the people to see who he was as the son of God without seeing why he came to pay the penalty for sin. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I've been scratching my head at this question, and I know even in our community group this past week we've been talking about it, is why is it that Jesus is so secretive? Why is it that when he heals somebody, when he reveals himself to be the son of God, why is it he says, guys, don't tell anyone? Don't go out and tell anyone. But yet, here, in this passage we hear today, Jesus speaks plainly of the fact that he is going to suffer and die and rise again. The truth is, I think that Jesus didn't want them to just see him as the Son of God. I think that Jesus wanted them to see him as the Son of God going to the cross. His ultimate purpose was not to come and say, hey, check me out, look at me. But rather, his purpose for coming was to say, check me out, look at me on the cross. Look at what I'm doing for you. I am God in the flesh, and I've come to rescue you, and this is how I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it by show, just throwing fireballs from my hands and, and magically making bunnies appear from rabbits or walking on water or flying around. I'm going to save you by giving myself completely for you. That is why I'm here. If we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, this shift in Mark's gospel impacts our purpose as well. It involves us. That's the nature of why the book of Mark is called a gospel. Because it's good news. It's not just a story. We don't gather here this morning for a history lesson. We gather because this so-called story, this event that has happened impacts us as well doesn't just stay on the pages, it leaps off the pages to our hearts and changes people's lives and has been doing this for centuries, has been changing people's lives, the message of the gospel. And friends, this is what it's going to say to us today. There's no way of getting around to it and there's no way of, of sugarcoating it. If Jesus is going to the cross, we are going to have to go to the cross too. We are going to have to go to the, the way of the cross because it is at the cross, Jesus tells us today, it is at the cross in losing ourselves that we will find ourselves. We will find who we truly are. Do you know what this means? Do you know what this means to you? This means that your identity is not wrapped up in your family, your relationships, your job, your money, your skills and abilities, your intelligence, how you look. Your identity, who you are, is not wrapped up in the things you do, but is wrapped up in who Jesus is. And if you want to know who you truly are, you must go to Jesus. If you want to find your true identity, you must go to Jesus. So today, let's look at the way of Jesus and find what that means for us to follow him. The way of Jesus. Verses 31 to 33. Jesus reveals the true nature of the Messiah right after Peter's confession. Right after Peter says, you're the Christ, ding, he gets the right answer. Jesus goes, okay, I'm the Christ. And guess what? I'm going to suffer. I am the son of, he, it says that he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer. Now, interesting, that word son of man is not just referring here to someone who's born of man. It's not a son of man. Because indeed that would be true of all of us guys here, right? We are, are sons of men. But in this term, you'll notice that it's capitalized there. There's, there's something different about this term, and it actually refers back to the Old Testament, where the word, word son of man is used several times over and over, but probably the most clearly in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. You don't have to turn there, I'm going to read it for you. 
Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where it tells of the Son of Man, not a Son of Man, the Son of Man. And this is what it says. I saw the night visions. This is Daniel prophesying. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and in his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now, if you were an ancient Jew at this time, hearing Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man, that gets you going, right? That gets your, you know, that gets your blood flowing in a good way. You're excited because you know what that Son of Man means. You mean, that means you have someone who is here who's going to conquer for you. You have someone who's going to come. And at this time, keep in mind, the Jews were suffering a lot of oppression from the Romans. And so when Jesus says, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of Man, they get this picture in their head of this majestic figure walking out of heaven and saying, enough of the suffering of my people. I'm going to conquer, I'm going to win, and I'm going to create a new kingdom, and it will not be taken away. And so it gets them going, right? It's a political thing. It's an eschatological thing. It's like an end times kind of thing. It's, it's their hope. Jesus is their superhero. He's what they've been looking for. But then look at the words right after Son of Man in the passage today. The Son of Man must suffer. All of a sudden, the wind, <laughs> seems like the balloon has popped for them. In doing this, Jesus, referring to Daniel chapter 7 as being the Son of Man, is also referring to another passage in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, where the Lord speaks of a suffering servant. One who, if you look in verse 3 of Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one with whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. God has smitten him, afflicted him. The picture that we get here does not seem to line up with the picture we get from Daniel 7. So what is Jesus doing here? He's tying the two together as one and the same. He's saying that Messiah, that glorious, majestic figure that you are reading about in Daniel chapter 7 is the same suffering servant in Isaiah 53. Now this just rocks their world. And for a lot of us here today, it probably rocks our world too. How can a king lose? How can a king suffer? How can he conquer through loss? Because in our day and age, we are afraid to lose. Right? We're afraid to lose control. We're afraid to lose our loved ones. We're afraid to lose you know, uh, our comfort, our security. We're afraid to lose those things in our life. And Jesus is saying, I am going to lose. Now this is unfathomable, unthinkable for the Jews of that day. And, and even for Jews today, to think that a Messiah can conquer through suffering. That through death through being beaten and whipped and, and, and dying a horrible death. That Jesus would be able to be majestic, be a, a conquering Savior. And so Peter takes it upon himself. He says, okay, Jesus, enough bread and fish for you today. You know, let's, let's pull you aside, Jesus. And it says that he begins to rebuke Jesus. The same word is the word that's used that we looked at last week in verse 30, where Jesus strictly charges them. Peter comes to Jesus and says, uh-uh, Jesus, no. Why? Because ever since his being on his mother's knee, Peter's been taught this picture of a Messiah as this conquering, majestic figure. So to even imagine that this majestic figure would become this thrown out, rejected, beaten up, destroyed, conquering servant, just is unbelievable. See, back then they taught that Isaiah 53, and even today, a lot of Jews believe that Isaiah 53 simply means that it's referring to the suffering of Israel, the things that they had to go through. But 
But there's so much more in that. There's, it's pointing to one who would ultimately suffer the greatest suffering on our behalf. So Peter takes Jesus aside and strictly charges him. And look at Jesus' reaction. Peter takes him aside privately, trying to not make a big stir. And Jesus turns to his disciples. Probably because Peter, as we know, in a lot of cases, <laughs> Peter speaks for a lot of the disciples who are too afraid to speak, right? It's like, you know, the other disciples are, you know what, I hate confrontation, but I'm thinking it. And, you know, for Peter, Peter it's like, you know, I'm thinking it, and it's coming out. You know, he's, he's a realist, right? He's the, if it's on in his mind, it's out of his mouth. And Peter, or Jesus, turning to his disciples, because they were probably thinking the exact same thing, turns to his disciples and openly rebukes Peter. And uses a word that we don't often use to refer to even in our enemies, right? Get behind me, Satan. I'm a sting, right? Just a little bit. Can you imagine Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, calling you Satan? Heavy. A bit too harsh, maybe? Especially in our day and age, maybe it seems like, whoa, that's kind of offensive. That's insulting. Why is it that Jesus goes to this extreme? Why is it that he goes so far and called Peter the devil? Well, I think the underlying question is the question we've already asked. Why is it that Jesus must suffer? If you look at verse 31, you'll notice that the word must controls that whole sentence. He must suffer, must be rejected by the elders, must be killed, and must be risen again. So why is it that Jesus must suffer? Why is it that Jesus must be rejected, must Die. Now, there's, there's countless reasons for this, but I, I want to highlight just a couple, if I can, this morning. A couple of reasons, some of the key reasons why Jesus must suffer. Because for some of you, you might be thinking, okay, if Jesus is powerful enough to take my sin upon himself, if Jesus is powerful enough to conquer my sin, why did he have to die? Couldn't he have done it another way? Couldn't he have just, you know, just flipped his fingers and said, oh, it's all done, it's paid for? Couldn't it just have been that way? There's a lot to Jesus' suffering. There's a lot to his sacrifice. First of all, Jesus must suffer to show us true <coughs> love. He must suffer to show us true love. Now, there are several different, inter several different ways of loving people, right? There's romantic love. There's brotherly love, you know, there's like the friendship love, there's erotic love, there's all sorts of different types of love that we read about even in the Bible that we see in our world today, but it boils down to one of two categories, true love or superficial love, or like to save time, fake love, fake love, fake love involves this. Fake love involves us loving someone because of what, for what we can get for ourselves out of them. We give love to them. We do all the right things for them. Not for them, but ultimately because we know it's going to come back to us. Right? It is conditional, and it is also, fake love is also invulnerable. I'm only going to give just enough to myself, of myself to that person, it's guarded, right? When we when we fakely love someone, it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that for them, but I'm not going to let them see the real me. I'm not going to spend all of me on that person because, you know what, if, if, if things go south, you know, if things go wrong, I can just cut my losses and just walk away with only a couple scratches, right? Fake love is not about what I can, is not about what I can give, but about what I can get. Ultimately, what I can get. True love spends itself unreservedly uh, for the happiness of the other person, because its joy or happiness is in the joy or happiness of the other person. It's not about what I can get, but it's rather about what I can give. That's true love. True love is me saying to my wife, I love you even if you never love me back. I love you so much that I will, I will do everything in my power, every waking moment, 
thinking about your well-being and not my own if it drives me to the grave. Now, there are glimpses of true love. I'm not, all, I'm not calling you all fakers here this morning, but because of sin, here's the reality. Because of sin, we're more likely to get fake love than true love. Because of sin, we all need true love. But here's the catch. None of us can truly give. We all, need to, we all need someone who just loves us so much that they're going to spend themselves entirely for us. But because we are so broken and flawed, we can't give that to someone else because we're so selfish. It all comes back to us. I'm going to love, but I'm, ultimately I'm going to get something back eventually, right? And that's the way we view love. What we need is someone who doesn't need it, who doesn't need true love but can freely give it. Friends, enter Jesus. Enter the Son. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, three in one as the Trinity. And this is the amazing thing of the Trinity. They are complete, lacking nothing. They completely love and are loved by one another. They did not need us. We are not needed by them. God did not need someone to love, therefore he created the world. God, as three in one, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has been loving the, himself as in each person in the Trinity since the be before time. For all eternity, they are completely fulfilled. So Jesus is not lacking anything. He looks at his creation and doesn't think, I need to love them. I will love them. I give myself to them. I will give fully to them. He doesn't need love. He doesn't need that true love because he's completely fulfilled by the Father's love, right? Jesus says this countless times over and over and over. I am in the Father and the Father lives in me. And I love the Father and the Father. Father loves me. It's this continuous back and forth of perfect love. And Jesus comes in and spends himself entirely for us. He gives everything for us. So much so that he would go and die the most horrible death. So much so that not just physically he would take the the suffering upon himself, but spiritually. He would take hell upon himself to die in our place. He, that is true love. And when you get that, when you understand that, when you really let that take over your life, friends, you don't need any other kind of love. You are secure in his love. And do you know what that does to you? Do you know what that does? When you are secure in his love, when you realize that his love is what fulfills you, that is freely given to you, that Jesus held nothing back to you, you can give that kind of love to other people. You can spend yourself at the, at the, for the sake of other people, and friends, it's not a loss, because you are completely, completely secure in who Jesus is. So first of all, Jesus suffered to show us true love. Secondly, Jesus suffered to show us true <laughs> forgiveness. He suffered to show us true forgiveness. Think about this for a, for, for a second this morning. Someone borrows your car, and they wreck it. All $500 of it, right? <laughs> they smash your car up real good, right? They borrow your car, you willfully, graciously give them your car, and they smash it. There's two choices. Either they can pay, or you can pay. Either they will have to pay you that $500 or 50 bucks or whatever it might be for your vehicle, you know, and, or you will absorb that cost upon yourself. You'll say, no way, I got it. Either way, it's going to cost one of you. It's going to cost you something. And if you absorb that cost, if you take that upon yourself, you are saying, okay, that's, gonna, that's 500 bucks at the door, and I still have to buy a new vehicle. You absorb that cost. Now think about it even another way. Someone robs you of an opportunity. Someone steps into an opportunity that should have been yours. 
Someone else takes that job or, or, you know, they get that really neat opportunity and you're like, ah, oh, I should have that. Now you can choose to get even. And in so doing, become like that. You can offend. Because they've offended you, you can think, oh, it's my, you know, it's my right to have revenge, to seek revenge. They've done this to me, they've hurt me. I'm going to hurt them in return. Or you can choose to forgive and suffer the temptation to fight back. See what happens there? When you forgive, you absorb the cost, and it is not something that just goes away. It is suffering. Forgiveness always entails suffering for the forgiver. It does. Forgiveness always entails suffering for the forgiver. Have you ever been hurt by someone else before and you've had to forgive them? True forgiveness is saying, okay, I am not going to fight back. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to love. Even though I've been hurt, and you still have to suffer through that hurt. You still have to suffer through that. And you can't confront with vengeance. You can't just come to them with revenge and just say, ah, like, I'm going to get you back. What's going to happen? That person's going to be like, uh, I'm glad I did that to you, right? I'm glad I hurt you. I'm not going to listen to you. But if you come with forgiveness in your heart, right, true forgiveness, true love, that's when people start to see, man, I robbed that person of an opportunity. I took that from them, and they're just loving me. They're, they're giving freely to me. Like, who does that? And all of a sudden, they start to realize what they've done. See, friends, at the cross, Jesus absorbed the cost for us. At the cross, Jesus suffered in our place to forgive us, right? He had to show us that he was suffering for us to forgive us, to help us see our error. He didn't do it with vengeance in his heart towards us. He did it with true forgiveness. Now, last thing. Jesus suffered to show us true love, true forgiveness, and true power. True power. Jesus' death was not a suicide. It wasn't, he didn't just throw himself off a cliff. Jesus' death was murder. Plain and simple. It was murder. Jesus' death had to be violent. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And even the word blood there refers not to just someone, you know, getting in an accident or falling off a cliff, but someone who is murdered, a violent, painful, bloody death. Why? Because it's paying for sin. It's paying for all wrong and any wrong. Now, if you notice what it says in verse 31 there. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. Notice that it doesn't say that Jesus was murdered by sinful people of that day. Notice that it wasn't just some angry mob that grabbed Jesus and lynched him. He wasn't murdered by thieves. He was murdered by the so-called righteous people of that day. He was murdered by the pastors, the government leaders, the soldiers. He was murdered by the ones that we would trust today to lead us. Why is it that Jesus did this? In suffering by their hands, Jesus, who was completely innocent, where there was no fault. It says constantly, as you read the story of the Passion of Jesus' crucifixion, it says, you know, Pilate could not find any fault in him. But yet they killed him anyway. In doing this, Jesus, who was innocent, was exposing them to be corrupt. Exposing them that even, you know, the most powerful person in the world is still sinful. Even the most so-called righteous person, the person who looks like they got it all together, they screw up. They mess up. Jesus lost to them so that he could triumph over them. Colossians 2.15 says that he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him at the cross. 
in his weakness, in going to the cross, Jesus emerged victorious, friends. Nothing could keep him down. And I'm thankful for that today. Nothing could keep him, the grave from breaking open and him coming out. Notice the hope that's in that passage, that he would rise again after three days. He knew it even from then, and he spoke it plainly. He spoke it plainly. Jesus was showing his power being made perfect in weakness. You remember 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Think about this. What demonstrates true power more? That the power of God is stronger than man's strength, or that the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength? Jesus at his absolute weakest, if there is such a thing. Jesus, in going through weakness, was able to triumph, was able to be victorious. Isn't that a powerful God? Isn't that amazing that, that, uh, 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 that he would do that? And friends, Jesus did this ultimately because it was God's will. Isaiah 53.10 says that it was God's will to crush him. Because in so doing, God would reveal his true love, his true forgiveness, his true power by sending Jesus to a cross, by sending Jesus to a place where he would be ultimately, utterly ridiculed and cast out for us. And Jesus, who saw this as God's will, as, his, as seeing us being lost in our sin, seeing God's, and being obedient to God's will, Jesus was not going to let anything get in the way of that. Nothing. I am so thankful for that, friends. I am so thankful that Jesus didn't let anything get in the way, not even his own disciples. See, what Peter was doing when he was trying to rebuke Jesus, he was getting in the way of the cross. He was stepping in front of Jesus and the cross, and Jesus is like, no. No. Uh -uh. I'm sorry, Peter. I love you too much to let you get in the way. I love you too much to get in the way of what I'm going to do for you. Because, friends, think about this. In our pop culture here today, we often think about the devil as doing anything and everything he can to destroy Jesus. And the answer is, sort of. Jesus, Satan didn't want Jesus going to the cross. He didn't. It wasn't like Satan was the one who crucified Jesus and nailed him to the cross. It was that he wanted to do everything he could to keep Jesus from going to that cross. Even if that meant influencing one of his closest followers. Now, Peter was not possessed, but yet influenced. He was not possessed, but yet influenced. And it's amazing that even after Peter makes this great statement, after he says that you are the Christ, Satan's influence is there. I think it's a picture back to the parable of the sower. Right? We looked at couple, many months ago, where we read about the seed that falls on the open path. It's the word of God that falls there, and then the birds come and pluck it away, right? When the word of God is spoken, there's the devil. So here's, here's a challenge to you today. Don't be surprised that when the word of God is spoken today, the devil's not right there to push back at you when you we're not living in peaceful time. We are in a battle, friends. Spiritual warfare is huge. For Jesus to be the Messiah, he had to suffer. He had to suffer. So what does this mean for us? What do you do with someone who does this for you? How do you respond? There is a response. And Jesus explains it in verses 34 to 38. Look at what he says, not just to his disciples. He says he turns to and calling the crowd to him. He wants this to be widespread, and it's also for us here today. Verses 34 to 38. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. First of all, you must Deny yourself if you're going to follow Jesus. You must deny yourself. This is not, you know, bubbly language. This isn't feel-good moments. I know for a lot of you sitting here today, you're like, okay, what on earth does that mean? And I'm sure the disciples are like, okay, I'm losing it now. 
Like, what is it that Jesus is true? What does he mean by that? I deny myself. I must give myself up. Now, he's not saying you must deny yourself something, deny oneself something, but deny yourself. It's not about saying, well, okay, now that I'm following Jesus, I won't do that. I won't do that. I won't do that. I won't do that and that and that and that. No, it's not about denying yourself something. Rather, it is about denying yourself. Completely reorienting your life around God and not yourself. The primary focus in your life is no longer you when you follow Jesus. It's no longer you. It's not about you anymore. We live in a world that is so consumed with self. It's about what I want. And friends, sadly today, depression, suicide, all sorts of these things are on the rise. Why? Because people aren't fulfilling. They're not being fulfilled by the things even when they get them. Like look at our celebrities today. They're just as messed up as we are. They just have more money. Right? But to deny oneself is to completely change yourself as being the center. And again, we've asked this question before. Do we exist for ourselves? Or do we exist for God? Because if we exist for ourselves, then it really doesn't matter what I do. I can go off and do whatever I want. This, that, and the other thing to whomever I want. No big. But if we exist for God, doesn't that change how we view our lives? Doesn't that change the way things work for us. If you want to follow Jesus, you have to lose yourself. You have to lose yourself. Mark Dever says that when we begin to contradict our will with his will, that is when we start to follow Jesus. When we contradict our will with his will, that is when we begin to follow Christ. It's when we wake up in the morning and we say, instead of saying, okay, what do I want to do today, we wake up in the morning and say, God, what do you want me to do today? I want your will to be done, not mine. I want your will to be done. But friends, it sounds like something really difficult and tough, and yeah, it is. But guess what? There's something amazing that happens when you start to do this. You find that your identity is not found in things or people or your job. You're not running like a rat in the wheel, right? You're not constantly running around in circles. Your life is not based on performance. Your life is, is found in Jesus and in Jesus Christ alone. And that gives you identity. That gives you purpose. That gives you meaning. You know, in so many cultures in our world... Like, we, we live our world, and we say, I, in our world, and we say identity is based on the things that I gain for myself, right? In some, some cultures, you're not someone until you have a family. In some cultures, it's, you're not someone unless you own a house. You're not someone unless you have a job, or you have, you, have, you know, uh, all the money, or you're wearing the right clothes, you know? In, in our culture especially, it's very individualistic focus, right? We're very focused on ourselves and ourselves as the individual. When our identity is found in Jesus, friends, man, nothing can take that from you. Nothing. Think about that. Jesus died and, and suffered at the hands of these so-called righteous men who had the power to kill them. And even today, we live in a world where people have the power to kill us. But guess what? That's the only thing they can do to us. That's the only thing. They cannot take from you your security in Jesus. They may be able to take your life, but they cannot take your identity. It says so right there today. What does it profit that a man gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? Your soul can't be taken from you if it's in Jesus. C.S. Lewis says at the end of his book, Mere Christianity, this is what he says. It'll be on the screen behind me. The more we get what we know, or what we now call ourselves, 
out of the way and let him take us over, the more truly ourselves we really become. Get this, our real selves are all waiting for us in him. Our real selves are all waiting for us in him. That means you are not defined by what you have just done yesterday or 10 years ago. You are defined ultimately by what Jesus has said and what he, who he says you are. Isn't that freeing for us? Isn't that incredible, friends? Think about all the guilt that you are carrying from that action that you did 10 years ago. It is so freeing. Your identity is not wrapped up in what is behind, but is what is ahead and what has been done for you. Your real selves are all waiting for us in him. The more I resist and try and live on my own, the more I become dominated by my own heredity and upbringing and surrounding and natural desires. It is when I turn to Christ, when I give myself up to his personality, that I finally begin to have a real personality all of my own. Nevertheless, get this. This is a disclaimer. You must not go to Christ for the sake of a new self. As long as your, pers your own personality is what you are bothering about, then you are not going to him at all. In, in essence, this is what he's saying. If you come to Jesus to get yourself, you won't get it. But if you come to Jesus to get Jesus, you get both. You get both. This is, the, this is how the gospel works. That's why Jesus says, if anyone would follow me, you're not following me for yourself. You're following to see who I am, what I've done, and that gives you purpose. That gives you a sense of understanding and identity. And lastly, friends, you must take up your cross. You must deny yourself, and you must take up your cross. The image here is of a man dying, a man carrying his cross, which is what happened. And again, this is Jesus' first indication of how he would die. Up until this point, he was very vague. He didn't say anything. But here he's saying it plainly. I'm going to die on a cross. If you want to follow me, you've got to take up your cross. Because in those days, crucifixion, the way they would do these things is they would take a prisoner and give them horrible, horrible beatings. Like beat their backs until it was hammered or beat, friends. Like I, it's gory. It's vicious. It's violent. And they would make that broken, busted open back carry a heavy piece of wood. And with splinters, like they didn't sand these things. It's not like, you know, your nice, typical, pretty picture of a cross that we see in our religious symbols today. This is not a cute illustration. This is a method of torture and pain and suffering. And get this, they would, they would run them out through a crowd from public disgrace as they're carrying their cross and people would be hurling insults at them, throwing rocks at them, beating them up, tripping them, kicking them. And they would lead them out, not to like this private, desolate area. They would put them in a place where they would be seen by everyone, either up on top of the hill or along the road. Think about that. Driving down the street in Montague and seeing people crucified along the road. It was not a private thing. It was open, public disgrace. They would strip them down naked, nail them to a cross, and have them hanging there for dear life. And it was long and excruciating. And people passing by would spit on them, curse them out, would throw things at them, would break their legs. It would be utter torture. And that's what Jesus is calling us to. Maybe not literally, in the sense of picking up a, a physical cross. I'm not talking for you to go out from here and find a piece of wood. But maybe it looks something like in your workplace. People knowing that you're a Christian, and maybe they don't like it. Maybe it means standing up for that person who no one else will stand up for. Maybe it means maybe it means physical suffering. I don't know. I don't know what God has planned for each and every one of us, but we 
what is it and what is it that it means for you to take up your cross and follow him? It was not a cute illustration. The Jews got this, friends. They, when they heard Jesus say the word cross, they knew what that meant. It was not like, oh, it's a cross. Nice. We get to, you know, wear these nice, nice little necklaces and get tattoos with crosses on them. And, you know, flowers around them and lambs and things like that. No. They knew what this meant. And it was offensive to them. It was vulgar. It was like Jesus had just cursed them. <laughs> and they're thinking, this is what it means to follow Jesus. This is what it means to follow the Messiah. This is what it means. Friends, this is what it means. If you want to follow Jesus, you will suffer for him. Following Jesus in a fallen world will always involve suffering. There's no way to go about it. There's no sugarcoating it. We live in a sinful world that has set itself in opposition to Christ. And when we try to live for Christ in this world, we're, uh, we're going to butt heads. They're going to react. There will be a response from other people. And God calls us to love, to pursue, and follow even in the midst of that. Now, friends, I have to take this moment and just make a side, take an aside. Because suffering can take on different forms and different shapes, but I, I do want to just quickly say, and I'll say it very quickly for the sake of time, that there is a difference between suffering for Jesus and suffering as a result of sin. And I have to make that distinction. Because all too often we get people who say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm suffering for Jesus by fudging on my taxes. That's not suffering for Jesus. By being, being dishonest, you, you, and if you're suffering for that, you know, that, that's not suffering for Jesus. I'll just say that plain and simple. There is a difference. Please don't mix those up. Suffering for Jesus might not involve you giving your life to death, but are you willing to? Suffering for Jesus might not mean that you are ridiculed every day, every moment, but are you willing to? Suffering for Jesus might not mean that you have your money taken from you or, but are you willing to? Do you live with the members of your family in your household and say, God, they're yours. I can't keep them. But if you choose for me to suffer loss in them, they're yours. Use them for your glory, your kingdom. Max Stiles and I'll try to end with this. Max Stiles is a Christian author and evangelist who's traveled especially to the regions of, of Africa. And he would preach the gospel in, in churches. And one particular time, he was preaching at this church uh, in this country that was uh, very um, uh, centered on Islam. There was a lot of Muslims in, around there, and there were a lot of passionate, devoted Muslims. And Max Stiles was preaching the gospel in this church and, 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 you know, sharing about Jesus and what he's done. And after he finished his sermon, he was leaving the church. And this young man ran up to him afterwards, this young teenage boy ran up to him and said to him, I want what you have. I want what it is that you've got. I want that. And, and so Max Stiles, he was excited. He's like, yeah. It's great. And he starts to share with him the gospel. He starts to share with him about Jesus and what Jesus has done, you know, sharing about his death, his life, his resurrection, and especially focusing on the cost, especially focusing on, on what it means to follow Jesus, that we would have to lose ourselves, that we have to take up our cross and follow him. And the boy, you know, nodded his head and, you know, he would look down at the ground and kick the dirt a little bit, but yet he seemed to understand it seemed to Mac after a while that he, this young boy understood, and it almost seemed like he had heard this before. And so he asked him, you know, Robert, the boy's name was Robert, have you heard this before? You seem to understand what I'm saying to you. Like, this doesn't seem too foreign to you. And the boy looked at him and said, yeah, I understand. You see, I've heard it several times before from a note of my father. 
my father told me so much about Christianity. Then he would say to me, if you ever become Christian, I will beat you. I will beat you to within an inch of your life. And Robert said to Mac, he stopped, he said, tonight I'm going home to a beating. I'm going home to suffer for Jesus. Friends, don't take for granted what has been given to you. There is a cost to following Jesus. Consider it, please. Do you know what you're getting yourself into in following Jesus? It's not the ticket to the high life. For Jesus to be the Messiah, he had to suffer. For us to be his followers, we will have to suffer too. But friends, I can't end with this. I can't end with this heaviness. I have to end with good news because that's gospel. Self-denial and suffering may always be, seem to be the first word from Jesus' mouth in being a Christian. But friends, here's the good news. It's not the last word. It's not the last word. Look at 9 verse 1, the last verse that we look at today. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God at, after it has come with power. What is Jesus saying here? We could scratch our heads over that and think, well, okay, the disciples, it's not, is that referring to like heaven coming? Is that Jesus referring to a second coming? Oh, it's not, not specifically referring to that. What Jesus is referring to is the moments of glory which he will reveal his power in. Think about these disciples and all that they got to see. Think about it for a moment. Following this account, they got to see the transfiguration. They got to see Jesus in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration with Elijah and Moses standing beside him. And they got to see, it wasn't just like he was doing a magic trick. He, they got to see his splendor and glory. And Jesus is saying that you're not even going to taste death until you see that. And guess what? You're going to see me in my glory. You're going to see me when I rise from the dead. You're going to see me defeat death, friends. You're going to see me ascend into heaven with the glory of God. And guess what? You are going to be there when the Holy Spirit comes upon you on Pentecost and you are going to see 3,000 people come to know Jesus in one day. Is that not glory? Friends, our sufferings, our troubles may be light and momentary, but it is not the end. It is is not meaningless. We sang a song here today. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you. It's not meaningless. Your suffering is not meaningless. What you've gone through, what you're going through right now, and what you have yet to go through is not meaningless. And this is how I know. This is how I'm sure of it. And I'll end with this. 2 Corinthians 416. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day by day by day for this light and momentary affliction. And compared to the glory, that's all it is, friends. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are <coughs> eternal. There is hope in your suffering. That's always the way the Bible looks at suffering. When you go through suffering, it's not like, oh man, what did you do wrong to deserve that? The Bible says when you are suffering, guess what? It's achieving for you something greater than is to come. That's how the Bible views suffering. And that glory, friends, I, I long for that for all of you. To know that glory, that you can say, you can say, 
with all of these disciples who heard these crazy words, it sounds like, coming from Jesus' mouth, that for them who would suffer pain, that they would be able to say, Jesus, you're enough. You're enough for me. I'm going to pray for you. Because for some of you, you know suffering. Some of you resonate with this. Some of you find this hard to believe or understand that maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next year, something will happen. Maybe the sting of death will come to you. Friends, Jesus took the sting of death so that's all we could feel. That we will have glory in God. Let us pray as we close and we sing our final song. Lord Jesus, I love these people, and I know you love these people. And I ask that by your arms of mercy and grace, your, your arms of true love, true forgiveness, true power, God, you'd surround them. And Father, that you would be there to lift them up under the weight that they may carry. For many of them, they bear a weight, a suffering, maybe even just today, maybe even just this morning or this past week or a year from now, a year ago. For some of them, God, maybe they, there are sufferings to come in following you. And they're saying, I want to follow Jesus, whatever the cost. Lord, strengthen them. Holy Spirit, please move in them. Father, as we lift up your name, may you be the one that we celebrate. May we come to your cross and see what you've done for us, Lord. And may that change us from the inside out, we pray. Thank you so much for this family. Thank you so much for these people. They are yours, oh God. Father, we are yours. Lead us, we pray in Jesus' name.